Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Sometimes what we preach puts us in the doghouse. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to continue to fellowship together in your word, to feast upon it, to bask in the wonders of your grace. I just ask that you would filter out all the foolishness but seal to our hearts that which is truth and only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I'd like to begin by reading the last five verses of 2 Peter chapter 3. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all of his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, Beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. And we are studying together in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were in the areas of verse 19 of chapter 9, Romans chapter 9, verse 19. Now, I hear all kinds of opinions on the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. That means that he created the heavens and the earth and he created you so that you are sovereign. And now we have two sovereigns in the universe. Our only source of evidence and authority is the word of God. If God is not absolutely, completely sovereign, supremely sovereign over every single minute detail of your life, then your theology collapses. If that's what you believe, then this, that has ruined the entire basis of your biblical theology. Let's just say that God is not sovereign then all things don't work together for your good. If God is not sovereign, then something can separate you from the love of God. If God is not sovereign, then someone can bring a charge against you. Then you are not made righteous, and the truth that much of Christianity today holds dear becomes useless if God is not sovereign. If man indeed holds the final trump card, if he has the ultimate say in how the course of human history is determined, then the promise is not absolutely certain to all the seed. If God is not sovereign, 
then you cannot know the peace that passes all understanding. If God is not sovereign, you cannot know the joy that's unspeakable. If God is not sovereign, you cannot rest. In fact, if God is not sovereign, much of the hollowed beliefs of Christianity cannot be true. The only way in the world that we could go through chapter 8 in the book of Romans is that God is absolutely sovereign. I don't know why Christians rebel so much against the sovereignty of God. Jonathan Edwards wrote that early in his Christian experience, he hated any concept of the sovereignty of God. And the more he studied the scriptures, the more he came to realize that it was not only true, but essential. It was essential to Christianity. And in his later years, it, it became the great source of his joy, his rest, his peace, and his trust. And I declare to you that if in any way you believe that man is sovereign in any area of his life, then the great truths of Christianity are not yours. You cannot know them. And now the issue we are being forced to confront at this point in our study is that God is even sovereign over sin. And that seems to be a hollowed area in the lives of Christians. Oh, that cannot be. I tell you, dearly beloved, and I believe it's based on the Word of God, that no sin has touched your life that did not go through the sovereign plan of God. If you want to worship a God who is not God, I mean, I suppose that's your choice, but it won't change the fact. Therefore, he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardens. And you will read article after article that attempts to prove that God did not harden Pharaoh's heart, but it was that God was simply letting Pharaoh do what Pharaoh wanted to do when there was one reason why God raised Pharaoh up, and that was to show his power in him. Now, does he have that right? Why don't you argue that with God? Don't argue it with me. And we come to our verse. Therefore, thou wilt say unto me, and there are areas of Scripture that gender a question, and, and I suggest it to you that if, if you are properly teaching the truth of Scripture, these are questions that will come back. If you are properly teaching God's sovereignty, thou wilt say unto me, why does he find fault for who can resist his will? A good answer is nay, but O oh man, who are you who repliest against God? I wouldn't do that. How many times I've heard people say, well, if God be just, then this is not possible, or, or that is not possible. Listen, there is no if. There is absolutely no question. God is just. What God does is right. Why did he raise up Pilate? To condemn Christ. Not what Pilate wanted to do, but it's what Pilate did. By the determinant foreordination and counsel of God. Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against the God? God in that verse is articulated. There's only one God, no matter how much people rebel against it, we worship the God of truth. There is no God but the God of the scriptures. There are not many religions and many approaches to God. I'm not 
traditionally I'm not in the habit of mentioning names, but I'm going to here. Joel Osteen may be the largest Protestant church in the United States. His sermons are seen by over 7 million viewers weekly and over 12 million monthly in over 100 countries, but it is a it is popularly wrong. We worship the God of truth. Why do you reply against the God? Now look at the sovereignty. Look at it in the text. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why did you make me this way? There are no, you can note there are three answers. Why doth he yet find fault for who has resisted his will? The first one is, who are you that replies against God? Shall a thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? You didn't make yourself. Now, you, you may subscribe to some kind of foolish thought that we're self-made men and, and self-made women. It is God who gives the ability to make wealth. And many a wealthy person I've talked to considers it to be their ability to invest and to design and, and devise. But God is the one who gives the ability to make wealth. God is the one who makes the blind, the deaf, the dumb, the hearing. God is the one who kills and makes alive. God is the one who does whatsoever he pleases, both in heaven and in the earth and in all dark places and deep places. These are all passages of scripture. You're going to reply against God. He's the one that formed you. You didn't form yourself. You didn't make yourself. Shall the thing formed say to the one that formed it, and that's an aorist. Why hast thou made me thus? In another chapter, two chapters, we're, we're going to read, Oh, the depth of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his ways. If they're unsearchable, they're not known. Why can't I rest confidently in the fact that he made me what I am? Oh, if I had just done this, or oh, if I had just done that, oh, if I hadn't made that decision or this decision, oh, if I had just gone this way, and I talk to atheistic Christians every day, that's what they are. There's not a God who directs their lives, who holds them in the hollow of his hand, who lights their candle, bottles their tears, knows the way that they take, and when he's tested them, they will come forth as gold. Even among those who eagerly await for him to appear. Oh, if I hadn't done this or hadn't done that. And they live in what I call Christian atheism. He formed you. The question is not why he made you that way, but to rest in the sovereign grace of the almighty God. Doesn't he have power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? And oh boy, have we touched a boil. I would assume that you consider yourselves products of the Reformation. Let me tell you very bluntly that the bulk of modern Christianity is Romanism. And, and I don't mean by that the Roman Catholic Church. I mean most of the Christians I talk to. The, Reform the Reformation says that you are redeemed by the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ and that as a redeemed person, you'll believe. You do not become redeemed by believing. You are not born again because you believe. You may read it on the internet page after page after page. You know, once one accepts Christ, he becomes a new creation in Christ Jesus. And the very inference is that the depraved, incapable, spiritually dead individual can accept Christ. 
the Reformation. No, you are redeemed because you are born by the sovereign will of God. And as a new redeemed creation, you can believe, accept, and receive. My sheep hear my voice. Not only that, God not only redeemed his own, but he reprobated the rest. Ouch. Yeah. He formed one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. This is what the text clearly says. And Christians, you would think that you had stuck them with the cattle prod when you tell them that. Popular opinion is that after the fall, you know, we now have a fallen creation. And in that, God chose some to redemption and some to reprobation. Or he at least left them to reprobation, you know, reprobation. He didn't have to do anything because they were already fallen. But your Bible is telling you that you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. You were elected in Christ before man fell. That's what your Bible is telling you. God made one man unto honor and another unto dishonor. If you don't like that, I guess your case is with God. The scriptures declare it to be true. Hath not the potter power over the clay? And the answer is entirely obvious. Absolutely. He can grab that lump of clay and fashion a beautiful vessel or something that is terribly ugly. That's up to him. You ask, does he have any right? Who questions his right? What we know is what God has told us. The only God we know is the God of revelation, not a God that we made up. If God be God, he wouldn't do this or he wouldn't do that. How do you know that? And yet I believe most Christians believe in a God which they have designed. When I talk to people who are avowed atheists, I find that, that they don't believe in the God that they've designed. Well, I don't believe in him either. The only God I know is the God of this book. If these things aren't true, it's up to you to search the scriptures daily to see whether or not they be true. Doesn't God have the power over the clay of the same lump? And people say, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, but, but bear in mind, Steve, that was a fallen lump. It's fallen clay. If the potter didn't do anything with it, it's, it's all dishonor. That isn't what the text says. It says he had to make a vessel of dishonor, and he had to make a vessel of honor. I believe God sovereignly decreed this before he ever created the heavens and the earth. And I've suggested before, I do not believe God is in heaven making decisions. God decreed and that's it. Before the worlds began, he, he decreed and he decreed everything that's touched your life. If he didn't do that, he's not sovereign. And you cannot possibly tell me you do not believe in the sovereignty of God, and yet you believe all things work together for your good. You can't tell me that you believe in the sovereignty of God, and yet you believe nothing can separate you from the love of God. These, those are oxymorons. The reason nothing can separate you from the love of God is because God is sovereign. The reason everything works together in your life for your good is because God is sovereign. The reason he knows the way that you take is because he is sovereign and he's laid out that way. He formed some vessels to honor and some to dishonor. And we come to an interesting verse. It's the first one in the Bible that talks about why God created. I don't know how many articles I've read where people have sat down and, and surmised why God created, you know, he created this. You know, he created for this or that reason or the other thing. There are, as far as I know, only seven glimpses in Scripture of why God originally did what he did. And this is the first one. 
What if God willed to show his wrath against sin, to make his power known, endured with much long suffering vessels of wrath, having been perfectly fitted in past time for destruction? Bear in mind, this follows verse 21, where he made some vessels unto honor and some unto dishonor. And now, what if God willed to show his wrath? He made one that was of value to him and one that was of no value to him. He's patient. He endures with patience or long suffering in situations that in 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 situations he controls. You and I, we endure in situations that we don't control. That's a different word in the text, but that word can't be used of God. This word is macrothamia or macrothemi, thamia. He endures in situations that he does control. So he is in that situation by his own design, by his own sovereignty, and he controls it. So he's going to make his wrath known against these vessels of dishonor. Does he have a right to do that? Well, you question him, not me. I believe absolutely that my God is righteous and that he has a right to do anything he considers to be righteous. Further than that, I believe he's done that. I don't see God saying, oh, wow, that happened. I'll have to, I'll have to change my plan. And, you know, I didn't know that that was going to happen. We know in the Old Testament, when he fought for Israel, he rained meteorites down from heaven. When he created the heavens and the earth, he put them there. And they were up there in orbit for, I don't know, God knows how long, just because he had them ready for that one single battle. I want you to know this book reveals a great God. And he's making his wrath and power known against vessels fitted for destruction. It is just absolutely incomprehensible to most people that, that I talk to, that God, a God of love, a, a, a wishy-washy God who sits in a, in a rocking chair, you know, and, and, and wishes certain things would happen, you know, could ever make a, a, a vessel fitted for destruction. How would God show his wrath against sin if there weren't sin? And, and how would you ever know how much God was angered by sin unless we saw the consequences of it in the death of his son? Now we find that he willed to make known the riches of his glory on vessels of mercy, which he also had afore prepared unto glory. There's a difference. Uh, an interesting difference. The vessels fitted for destruction is a perfect passive. The vessels prepared unto glory is an aorist. And I think there's a world of meaning in that change. There's a difference between verse 22 and 23 in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That, that prepared unto glory is vested in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Even us, whom he has called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Now ye brethren, as Isaac was, are all children of promise. Folks, think of, think of that. As Isaac was promised to Abraham years before he was born as a true son, not, not a son by some scheme, but a true son of Abraham and, I, and Sarah. So you were promised to Christ as a true son before the world began. You are children of promise. Even us whom he's called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentile. The call isn't that, that you did something. 
that you accepted Christ. The call is that which took place before the foundation of the world, that you would hear and respond to him in due time. In fact, his timing, because you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, before the world began. I think there's a great difference in God sovereignly directing your life and God making you a robot. I don't think you're a robot. I think you actually do what you think you want to do. I think you all do what you want to do. And that's the problem with the word for will. If you look it up in the dictionary, it means desire. What do you do? You do the thing that you desire the most. Folks, if I engineered a situation where I knew exactly what you were going to do, and I engineered it, and you did it, did you do something that you didn't want to do? No, you did exactly what you wanted to do. You weren't a robot, but in actual fact, behind the scenes, you were directed by the sovereign power of the Almighty God, inner Pharaoh. Well, I should say, enter every person ever mentioned in the Word of God. No, I, allow me to go one step further, every person ever created. No, nobody, folks, can escape the sovereign will of God. And, and, and I am not a fatalist. I believe God so engineers my desires so that my desires are what he determined to be done. Now, I know that this is difficult. I know that these passages that we're going through are very difficult for a lot of people. I don't have all the answers. All I have is the Bible, and my Bible says that God directs my steps, that God has decreed that all things work together for my good. No matter what decision I make, God has decreed that it works together for my good. I've used the illustration before, of, you know, standing out down by the by the the river, the creek, the stream, a stream somewhere where the water is flowing in one direction, where, you know, which can be seen as the will of God. The water flowing in one direction, think of that as the will of God, the determinate will of God flowing in one direction. And all of the, the sand, the rocks, the pebbles, the all of the sediment, all of the debris along the bank of that stream that is caught up and swept up in that current are all the decisions that you and I make. But those decisions cannot in any way alter the direction of that current. We serve a mighty God. Look, I love you all. I truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.